Let's say you were caught cheating on your partner. How far would you go to make it up to that person? This woman was willing to go all the way, and maybe even farther beyond that. Today's case involves a young married couple, consisting of a 30-year-old man named Armando Barron and his wife, Brittany Barron, age 31. They have two daughters together, both young, along with a brand new baby born just last year. Despite the image of a typical happy nuclear family dynamic, they didn't really have a relationship that most would call happy. Armando tended to get very violent with Brittany, often beating her severely, even in front of the kids. Understandably being not so keen on her monster of a husband, Brittany began to open up to the idea of finding love elsewhere. She soon met Jonathan Amaralt, a 25-year-old young man, at Telefax Medical, where they both worked. Jonathan was a biomedical manufacturing engineer at Telefax Medical. He was a big sports fan and loved the outdoors. He was a big member of the hiking community and often posted about it on social media. His positive, cheerful demeanor and youthful lust for life was most likely very attractive to Brittany. They soon began an affair together, and is usually the case with affairs, things only went downhill from here. Our story starts on September 19th of 2020, a Saturday. For unknown reasons, possibly a routine, Armando decided to go through his wife's cell phone. He soon saw enough evidence to correctly convince him that she was having an affair. He learned of Jonathan and quickly flew into a rage like Brittany had never seen before. Armando beat her relentlessly, eventually pulling out a pistol and putting it in her mouth, only to take the gun out and choke her until she passed out. This was all right in front of their nine-year-old daughter, who witnessed the whole thing. Devising his own little master plan to get revenge, Armando took Brittany's cell phone and began texting Jonathan, pretending to be her, of course. He decided to lure him to a small secluded park in Ringe, an area of Cheshire County, and unfortunately Jonathan took the bait and decided to meet up. Armando got Brittany to come with him and left the kids with his mother, who lived in an adjoining home, telling her that they were going for a hike together. They arrived at the park together. Jonathan, coming to see Brittany, was soon ambushed. He punched him in the face and began to violently assault him, beating him to the ground, where he kicked him over and over repeatedly, all over his body. At gunpoint, he forced Jonathan to get back into his own car. Armando wandered off for a moment, likely pondering where to go next. Brittany sat in the car together with Jonathan. Noticing that Armando had left a machete behind nearby, he urged Brittany to grab it and use it to save them. They were both convinced that they were both going to die. She refused, saying that one blow wouldn't kill him and would just lead to him killing them both. Understandably, but disappointingly, it's apparent that she preferred only Jonathan would die in this situation. Armando returned to the car. He got Brittany, put his gun in her hands, wrapping his hands around hers as to lead her. He ordered her to shoot Jonathan. However, as she held the gun, she refused to move her finger to the trigger. Annoyed and enraged, Armando ripped the gun out of her hands and took it back. Instead, he ordered her to cut Jonathan's wrists. Sadly, she agreed and complied. Throwing him to the ground, he then ordered her to stand on his neck, effectively strangling him. Again, she complied. Why she refused to comply with giving Jonathan a quick and easy death and instead chose to comply with cutting him up and standing on his neck is unknown. However, despite the damage, Jonathan survived these attacks. This sent Armando into an even deeper rage. He grabbed the machete and viciously attacked him once more, cutting him all over his body. However, again, Jonathan still survived. He was conscious during the whole attack. Giving up on inflicting this sort of damage, Armando grabbed his gun and shot Jonathan three times, twice in the chest and once in the head. He was remarkably still alive, for now. He was put back into the back seat of his car. Brittany listened to him groan as he clung to life, slumped over in the car seat. 
the husband and wife began to pack the car with camping gear, during which Armando gave Brittany a pistol, putting it into her backpack. Armed the whole time they packed, with Jonathan still clinging to life, she continued to simply pack the car with more luggage. Armando ordered her into Jonathan's car with him, and told her to drive to a campsite that they frequented. The campsite they were shooting for was about 225 miles away, and sadly, after a lot of moaning and bleeding, Jonathan would pass away in the back of the car as Brittany continued to drive. Armando followed in another car, a jeep that he had borrowed from his mother's boyfriend. The couple stopped at a general store where they bought tarps, lighter fluid, cleaner, and a shovel. They hopped back into their cars and continued to drive, communicating over the phone the whole time. Armando told her that he was sorry for making her do this, but that, quote, once the sun comes up in the morning, I can forgive you. They soon arrived at the campsite, located in far north New Hampshire, near Errol, and set up camp. It was at this point that Armando ordered Brittany to remove the head of her lover. It wasn't a suggestion, and it wasn't up for debate. She did so. He had her put the rest of him into a tarp, which they then rolled up, intending to bury it elsewhere. It was at this point that the couple now decided that they should probably form an alibi at some point. Armando picked up Jonathan's cell phone and began texting his friends and family, making it seem that he was still alive somewhere. On the other side, Brittany called her workplace and informed them that she wouldn't be coming in on Monday, or possibly ever again. Two days later, on Monday the 21st, Jonathan failed to show up for work, something very unusual for him. His family and friends hadn't heard from him since that Saturday. His mother reported him missing, believing that something had likely happened to him on a hike. However, she did notice that his hiking gear was still at his home. Police came to his home, but found no trace of either him or his car. Talking to his co-workers, they heard of his likely affair with Brittany, and they also learned of her notable absence as well, and set off to look for her. Realizing now that people may come looking for Brittany, Armando ordered her to start texting her friends. He told her to tell them that she left for a while to clear her head. Going the extra mile, she also texted another friend and said that she was moving to New Mexico to start over and get a fresh start, saying that she wouldn't be seeing her kids again anytime soon. Her friends pressed her to tell him where she was, but she refused. Armando decided to head home, leaving her at the campsite. He left her with two guns, one of which was the murder weapon, for protection against the wildlife. He told her that she had better have disposed of the body by the time he came back. He said that he'd be back on Friday, and expected it all to be over and done by then, giving her about a week to do the deed. Brittany then buried the head of her lover. It's hard not to wonder what was on her mind at the moment. She wiped down Jonathan's car, burned all of his belongings, including his identification, and broke all of their cell phones. Looking for Brittany, police ran into Armando, still driving the jeep near their home, and asked if he knew where his wife was. He told them that he had last seen her on Sunday when he dropped her off to go camping with a few friends. The next day, on Tuesday the 22nd, a number of hunters would pass by Brittany's campsite, informing her that it was illegal to camp there. Feeling something was off, one of them notified the New Hampshire Fish and Game office. Two officers came up to investigate the scene, soon arriving at her campsite. They noticed a large brown tarp weighed down with sticks and stones covering a car a short distance away. They also noticed drag marks in the mud leading down to a small ravine where they found the body wrapped in a tarp. Brittany's response was simply, I'm in big trouble. She was soon taken into custody. The body was scheduled for an autopsy that Thursday, obviously being suspicious as all hell. Thursday, the 24th, in custody, Brittany was formally arrested. She confessed to everything, giving every detail she could think of. She told them about Armando discovering the affair, 
about how he beat her, and about how he killed Jonathan. Interviewers noted her two black eyes, burst blood vessels in her left eye, a bruised nose, a chipped tooth, cuts to her head, bruises on her arms, and marks around her neck consistent with strangulation. She was charged with three counts of falsifying physical evidence due to her disposal of the body and her destruction of his property and identification. One day later, on Friday the 25th, the police caught Armando as he was driving away from the home with one of his daughters. He told the officers that he was planning to take her somewhere private so that he could tell her that he and his wife were having a divorce. He was taken into custody as well, where he was arrested and charged with capital murder, along with charges related to the beating and threatening of his wife. He claimed to be completely innocent, so uh, take that as you will. Brittany appeared before the judge that day, where her lawyer gave a passionate request to release her from jail. He insisted that everything she did was under severe duress after having already been severely beaten. Not to mention that Armando was armed the whole time he was giving the orders. She had no record, had no history of violence, fully cooperated with the police, and told the whole story. In plain English, she helped solve this crime, he said. He further insisted that she needed to be at home with her daughters and requested that she be able to leave with electronic monitoring. However, the prosecutor disagreed. He noted that she had multiple chances to fend off her husband both before and after the crime. There was the moment they were both left with a machete, the moment the gun was in her hands, and the entire time she was armed with a pistol in her backpack. She also drove a separate car for a three-hour trip never veering off course to get help, never calling anyone other than her husband. When she was alone in the woods, she could have asked any number of the hunters who came across her for help as well, which she never attempted. He stated that, if released, she may still pose a danger. She obeys orders from her husband, no matter their severity, and may continue to do so, he pressed. Of course it was argued that everything she did was under severe duress, that she was being threatened with her life, and that she was terrified of her husband. But in the end, however, the judge agreed and refused her bail. Uh, there was no debate on Armando getting out on bail, however, he's in there for good. In court, the prosecutor further argued, saying, the brutality of the crime combined with the destruction of evidence in a capital murder was especially alarming. He continued to say that, had the evidence been completely destroyed, they may have even gotten away with the crime. Now, in their state, the death penalty had actually been repealed the year before, leaving Armando's likely punishment to be life in prison without the possibility of parole. They were both hauled into prison, indefinitely for the time being. Brittany continues to do her best to maintain contact with her children via video visits. It is unclear if their daughters really know what they did or why they are in prison. Their court dates suffer delay after delay due to the sheer mountains of evidence to sift through and the difficulties imposed by the current global situation. In January of 2021, Armando requested a parole hearing. He stated that his wife has actually been lying about the murder this whole time, insisting that she has good reason to lie. However, he was mostly ignored, and it's not known what this supposed reason to lie is. Now, at the time of this video, both currently remain in jail, awaiting trials. Brittany is likely to receive about a year in prison for her crimes, which she has already served a substantial amount. Armando, however, will likely never see a day outside of jail. Again. The family and friends of the victim, Jonathan Amaralt, are in grief and understandably extremely distraught about what happened. As his best friend shared on Facebook, he was murdered and left alone for four days. I am disgusted, I am angry, and I am terribly sad. So once again, everyone out there, thank you for watching my video. Uh, you'll notice I look like shit today. That's all, that's the end of that statement. So if you enjoyed the video, please give it a like, uh, share it if you found it interesting, subscribe if you want to see more 
odd, kind of lesser talked about crimes. And uh, yeah, I'll be around. So see you next time.